John chapter 3 today, so when you get your Bible, turn to John chapter 3 with me. We're going to look at the first 15 verses, verses 1 through 15. Did you email me all your verses? This okay. one. I just need to make sure. Okay, are you good? If I keep going? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, John chapter 3, I'm going to read from verse one, starting in verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. And so as we look at this passage today, and we consider what this passage teaches us, it teaches us about salvation, about regeneration. And as we think about ourselves as men, as ministers of the gospel, as those who are training to serve the Lord in ministry, we know, we're told over and over again, what a high calling it is. That we have the highest calling from God. That we would be entrusted to deal with men and women's souls. It's the happiest and the hardest and the most difficult and the saddest and the most interesting and the most difficult in many ways of all callings that God could place upon a man's life. And so often we imagine ourselves at Judgment Day, and think, I, I just want to get to the end and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I just want to be faithful in what he has called me to do. Faithful to the message, faithful to the people, faithful to Christ my Lord. And we always imagine that, but I want you to go there again for a second and just imagine, now you're not the one standing before the Lord. It's the people that you've served. It's the single mom. It's the hardworking dad, it's the children, it's, it's the people in your congregation. Can you see their faces and can you see them standing before the Lord? And you're off to the side and you're hearing God speak to them and saying either, well done, good and faithful servant, or I never knew you to part from me. Today, as we look at this passage and we learn, we're going to see three truths about salvation and the goal is that they would shape our approach to ministry so that our lives in ministry would be such that one day when we stand and we, we see those that we've ministered to, that we would know that by God's grace we did everything we could. We were faithful to the message that he's given us. We were faithful to our Lord. And that even though he's in control, even though he is in total control of who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, he has called us and given us work to do. And so we want to see these three truths about salvation that will shape our approach to ministry so that we will be faithful to what God has called us to. So we're looking at John 3, and we've got to remember the purpose of the book of John, he tells us at the end, is that we would see that Jesus is the Christ and that we would believe in Jesus as the Messiah and have eternal life. That's the goal, that's the thrust of the whole book. Everything else in the book is pointing us towards that, that Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, that you should believe in him. And if you look down, Jesus has just cleared the temple. It's 
the Passover feast, and it says in verse 223, it says, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, and many believed in his name's name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. And now 3.1, now there was a man. See how those tie together? So John has just said there's all these people there. They're seeing the signs and, and they have some form of belief, but it's not genuine. And Jesus knows that. He knows what's in people. And now he's going to bring forward Nicodemus. And why? Think it, it, Passover feast. This is like Disneyland on a crowded day. It's crowded. There's people. I'm guessing that this isn't the only conversation Jesus had. But John takes Nicodemus out of the whole crowd and puts him forward. And not only that, he puts him to the front. This is the first Time that Jesus is going to engage in a conversation in the book of John. First time he gives teaching in the book of John. And so, why this man? Why here? Well, number one, to emphasize the importance of the new birth. You must be born again. If you want to see heaven, if you want to see eternal life, you must be born again. Not it's a good idea, not it's helpful, not it's one step in money. No, you, you must, and not you must know about it, not you must give assent to it, not you must acknowledge that it's necessary. No, you actually yourself must be born again. You, preacher, and your people must be born again. So it's moved forward for importance. But why bring out, why, why Nicodemus? Well, if anyone was saved in Israel, it was him. If anyone would have been able to earn their own righteousness, oh, it was Nicodemus. And look, look at verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees, and we're just going to look at, look at what are his credentials. See, this is, this is the first point. Nicodemus' is insufficiency. Nicodemus' is insufficiency. It's in verses 1 through 3, and we're going to see that he was not sufficient to earn salvation. And if anyone would have been, he could have been, why? Verse 1, now there was a man, point number one for him, he's a, he's a man, and in that culture that's a bonus, he was a man of who? Of the Pharisees, you have two main groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and if we're, if we're going to paint with a little bit of a broad brush, you could call the Pharisees the more conservative group, more like the fundamentalists, and the Sadducees are more like the liberals, the Sadducees, they reject the afterlife, they reject Miracles, they reject the word of God, and they're sellouts to the, to the Roman government. But the Pharisees, these are your conservative Bible thumpers. They want to go back to the Torah. They're Bible believing. They believe in miracles. They believe in heaven and hell, and they were loved because they weren't the sellouts. They were religious, at least outwardly. At least outwardly. So he's a man, he's a Pharisee. What else? He's a ruler of the Jews. This indicates that he was a part of the Sanhedrin, a part of the 70-member uh, ruling class of Jews. And what does this tell us? It tells us he was educated. It tells us that he had given long service. People would have known him and respected him. He don't just walk on to the ruling council. So he's a man, he's a Pharisee, he's a ruler of the Jews. And look at how much he gets right here. This man came to Jesus by night, and look at what he says to him. Rabbi, he calls him teacher. This is amazing. We learn in verse 10 that he's the teacher of Israel, and this the teacher of Israel comes to some random guy from Nazareth and puts him on the same level, calls him rabbi. Wow. So he calls him rabbi in verse 2, and he says, we know, speaking for the Pharisees, we know that you are a teacher. He acknowledges that he's a teacher. Come from God. We acknowledge that you've been sent by God, for no one can do these signs. He acknowledges the miracles. We know that no one can do these signs that you are doing unless God is with him. He even acknowledges that God is with him in a special way. He got so much right. And what a warning for us. What a warning for our people. So he, he has the right credentials. What's his condition, though? Well, from Jesus' answer, we can tell. Jesus answered him, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus cuts through like he always does. He cuts straight to the heart of the issue, and he says, Nicodemus, you are dead in sin. Just like every other human who has ever lived after Adam and Eve. 
who are dead in sin. Jeremiah tells us that our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Ephesians 2 tells us that we are literally dead in our trespasses and sins. And Romans 3 tells us that there's none righteous, not even one. So Nicodemus, your mountain of good works, your mountain of outward righteousness, it's not enough. You are not within the sphere of God's rule and in the sphere of his kingdom. You are rejecting the truth. You must be born again. All his dead works are like if I laid a corpse out right here and tried to start dressing it up. We could get the fanciest suit, the nicest shirt, get a fancy tie, nicer shoes probably than we all have, dress them up, make them real fancy. He's still dead. He's still rotting. What his good works are like. It's like dressing up a corpse. And so, so what for us? Well, here's just a few things. We need to beware that we would avoid seeing our ministry, our what God has called us to, as adding anything to our standing before God. We need to beware that we're not like Nicodemus, who has all the outward requirements, but dead on the inside. Our works do not justify us before God, and our works in ministry do not recommend us in any special way to God. Also, we need to avoid softening the message. That is so popular and so easy, and it slips in all the time. We need to avoid softening the message. We need to tell people it's insufficient. Whatever you would do apart from faith in Christ is insufficient to save you. And also, we need to avoid judging our ministries by outward activity. Just because someone looks saved from the outside, we don't always know. So beware. Beware. Beware assuming that because Awana is going on on Wednesday night and there's a Bible class and people are actually showing up for the prayer meeting, there's more than three, that that automatically means our ministry is thriving. We need to do what Jesus did and get to the heart and call people to repentance and faith and tell them that they must be born again. So point number one, Nicodemus is insufficient. You and I are insufficient. So we've seen his insufficiency, now we're going to see his inability. Nicodemus is inability. And Jesus is going to use two analogies to show us this here. So we're looking at his inability. In verse 4, Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? I think he's actually confused at this point. We're going to see later it's unbelief. But at this point, I think he's saying, how can a man be born when he is old? What are you talking about, Jesus? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now Jesus is going to introduce the two analogies. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is a little bit of a tricky phrase here. What's he saying? What's he saying? Well, there's quite a few options, and based on the time that we have together, I'm just going to walk you through why I think it is what it is. It could be that he's referring to water baptism. You must be born of water. You must be water baptized and have this spiritual rebirth as well. Well, I don't think it's that, because that would contradict Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that tells us that we're saved by grace alone not through work. So it, it can't be water baptism. I don't, I don't think it's water baptism. I don't think that it's physical birth. It could be saying you must be born physically and you must be born spiritually. Well, the word water never had that connotation in their minds. It wouldn't. We associate your water breaking with pregnancy and with birth. That's not the association at that time. It could be a reference to John's baptism. Maybe, but not all believers need to be baptized by John in the Jordan to be saved. I think what it's referring to here is spiritual cleansing. If you do just a regular search in the English of the ESV Bible for water, it comes up all over the Old Testament. And it's always, almost always used for cleansing things, for ceremonial cleansing and washing. And so Nicodemus, his brain when he thinks of water should be thinking cleansing, making things clean again. And so what's the point that Jesus is making here? You need to be spiritually cleansed, Nicodemus. And to have a spiritual new birth. Turn to Ezekiel 36. This might be where Jesus is specifically pointing back to. Ezekiel 36. God is talking about the new covenant that he's going to inaugurate. And he says in 25 that he's 
going to I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. Speaking of the Israelites, he's talking about a new covenant that he's going to inaugurate where he will put his spirit in his people. And this is the heart of the new birth, that you, you receive a new heart, that the mission control center of your life is completely changed. The sin that you loved, you now hate. And the God that you hated, you now love. And, and Jesus is telling Nicodemus, This is what you need. You need a fundamental change. You need a new heart. You see, remember the dead man that we were talking about? We dressed them all up nice. Dead people don't react to diamonds and snakes. If I take diamonds, and I had handfuls of diamonds, and I came to that dead man, and I held up the diamonds to his face, he wouldn't react, would he? No. He doesn't see their value. He's dead. If I took a, a deadly snake and I threw it on the dead man, he wouldn't move. He wouldn't run away. He's dead. In the same way, our hearts, when they're dead, the human heart doesn't respond to the beautiful, glorious truth of the gospel. It doesn't run away and treat sin like, like it is. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, this is what you need. But Nicodemus, you, you are unable. You are not able to cause this to happen. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The first analogy he's talking about is he's making a reference to birth. Nicodemus says, much part as you played in your physical birth in causing that to happen, that's how much you'll play in causing your spiritual birth to happen. And then the second analogy from the wind. The wind, verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. What's the point in talking about wind? Well, you can't see wind, you can't control wind, Nicodemus, but you see its effects, you see what happens from it. The two analogies are making the same point, Nicodemus, you didn't cause your, your physical birth, you won't cause your spiritual birth. Nicodemus, you can't control the wind, and you can't control what the Spirit does, where it gives life and where it doesn't give life. And how true is that for us as preachers of the gospel? We can't control. Don't try to manufacture salvation. You can't do it with lights. You can't do it with music. You can't do it with how good your preaching is. Depend on the Lord. Pray like He must do it. Preach like He must do it. Beg Him to bless your ministry and give you eternal fruit. And also, don't be discouraged when a corpse doesn't respond to the diamonds that you show don't be discouraged when you labor and you try to honor the Lord and you feel like no fruit is coming out of this ministry. You feel like no one is reacting. No one is changing. Where? What is the purpose of all that I'm doing? Well, remember the condition of the human heart. Remember that the corpse doesn't respond when you show him treasures. Unless God does something. So we've seen Nicodemus' insufficiency, his inability, and now we're going to see his only hope. His only hope, and it's our only hope. Nicodemus' only hope, starting in verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? We're going to see this is, this is unbelief. This isn't incredulity. This is unbelief. Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? We just need to stop for a second and take warning. We're seeing the effects of Nicodemus being dead in sin here, but we need to take warning because think of Nicodemus. Educated, respected. He would have probably memorized the Torah. He's thinking about it and has it on his mind. He's read. He's been exposed to revelation. He's been exposed to the works of God. He's been in the religious clergy setting. 
dead. We need to take warning. We can be exposed to the word over and over and over and over, and we can remain in our sin. We can remain deadened to the truth. Verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. The problem is unbelief. He will not receive it. It's not that he can't understand the new birth. It's not that he can't understand regeneration. It's that he willingly rejects it because of his unbelief. You do not receive our testimony. Jesus starts speaking in the first person plural. I think what he's doing here is identifying himself in the line of prophets and in the line of those who speak scripture, because Jesus here is showing that he is Nicodemus' only hope. Jesus is the ultimate prophet, the ultimate one who speaks for God, because he is God himself. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. And then in verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus is the ultimate prophet, and Jesus is the revealer of heavenly truth. Not only is he the revealer of heavenly truth, he's from heaven. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Nicodemus, I reveal heavenly truth. Nicodemus, I've come from heaven. And Nicodemus, I'm your only hope. And now he's going to point him back to an Old Testament story. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. He's pointing him back to Numbers 21. You can turn there with me if you want. And starting in verse 4, we're just going to read the story to give us get an idea of what's going on here. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up in, out into Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent. Jesus points back and he says, in the same way that Moses put that serpent on the pole and held it up, and whoever looked on it would live, in that same way, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. It is that Jesus that we hold up. It is this Jesus that we hold before our people and say, this is who you must trust. This is who you must put your faith in. This is the way to eternal life. This is your only hope. We must hold up Christ as Savior in our preaching, in our praying, in our evangelism, in our counseling to our family, neighbors, friends, co-workers, employees, employers, everywhere. And also, we've got to hold verse 8 in, in one hand and verse 15 in the other. Look, in, in verse 8, Jesus is emphasizing that the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound. But you do not know where it comes from, where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In verse 8, he's emphasizing this. I am I'm totally sovereign. I control everything. And salvation is of the Lord. And then you have 15 over here, and it says that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And we have to hold both of those in each hand. God is completely and sovereignly in control of salvation. And at the same time, we preach and we pray and we call to people and say, whoever believes in Christ may have eternal life, and we have to hold them both, and I can't explain exactly how they reconcile. And you don't have to, you just have to preach the truth and trust God with the results. Whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. We need to hold both of those. And so we've seen that Nicodemus is insufficient. His works weren't enough. And worse than that, he was unable to save himself. We saw his insufficiency, we saw his inability. 
And we saw that his only hope is Christ. And our only hope is Christ. And our people's only hope is Christ. You know, it, it's interesting. There was a story. An old preacher was asked one time, what do you think it would look like if Satan was given control of a city? Total control. Complete control. Some of us would probably say Las Vegas. Some people might say Washington, D.C., where all the politicians live. People might say all kinds of different things. You know what this old preacher said? He said, if Satan got total control over a city, well, the streets would get cleaned up. Drunks would come off the street. The bars would close. All the brothels would close. Children would become respectful to their parents. The pews would be packed. Everyone would be moral. It would look wonderful. There'd be no Christ preach. There'd be no... Jesus, it would just be morality. It would look great on the outside and dead in the inside. May God guard us from that. May God help us to set forth Christ and faith in Him as the only hope. May God guard us from trusting in ourselves, from trusting in any method. May He guard us from discouragement in the ministry. May He guard us from softening this truth. May God help us that one day when we stand before him, not only would we hear, well done, good and faithful servant, but our people that we have served would hear the same thing. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would make us faithful servants. I pray that you would help us to know and understand who you are more and to, to show Christ to others. Help us to speak the truth and to live lives that are in accordance with it. Help us to trust you and to love you more. Thank you.